been asked to talk about uh, studies of glucose control uh, and the suggestion is that uh, we have uh, had the wrong target and uh, I think uh, um, we have had the wrong target. Uh, I have no financial conflicts of interest in this uh, subject. The original data uh, rapidly accumulated to uh, eight large-scale English language RCTs and many, many other uh, RCTs uh, studying insulin, intensive insulin therapy in adults. And the, the key study, the progenitor study of all this, the study that drove the interest and all of the succeeding uh, enthusiasm, uh, was a study by the Leuven Group, Dr. Vandenberg, the PI, uh, published in the New England in 2001, published in the same issue of the New England Journal as the River Study. Quite an issue that was. I would say that there are perhaps uh, several wrong targets. I would say that uh, the first wrong target is uh, the surfeit of RCTs. Here we have a very large number of RCTs, and except for the uh, Leuven one, uh, surgical ICU, uh, essentially in terms of their primary outcome, primary analysis on mortality, they almost uniformly show that tight glucose control does not impact on mortality and that tight glucose control causes variable degrees of hypoglycemia. This all stopped in the adult world at least with the uh, nice sugar study and the nice sugar study there were over 6,000 patients in several countries an enormous undertaking. Mixed ICUs so uh, our last speaker spoke about the importance of treating each patient individually. It's a key issue. But if you're going to recommend a therapy like aspirin, for example, that's going to be used for everybody, then in those cases, you need to have studied it in everybody. Otherwise, you don't have generalizability. So whilst you lack specificity and you lack insight from this study, what you absolutely gain is generalizability. Unfortunately, the generalizability was that, in general, it causes harm. Does it cause much harm? Well, you know, a whole lot of harm, I suppose, except if you're one of the people who did badly. Uh, as a population level, the excess mortality was 2.6%. That's 2.6% of that study population. People in critical care are a little US focused. Well, it's a big country. You know, it's a good starting point. If you imagine 5 million patients in ICUs in the US, if you imagine 20% of them are mechanically ventilated in adult ICUs. Now, in other countries, in Canada and Australia and the UK and Europe, the percent of ventilated patients is infinitely higher than that, more like 85%. Hard to get into an ICU in other countries, but the US is very different. Nonetheless, that means if tight glucose control is truly generalizable to all medical surgical ICU patients who were ventilated, then the adoption of that practice caused, or would have caused, excess mortality of about 2.6% among those patients. How big a number is that? That's 20% of 5 million, that's a million, 2.6. I'm very leery of extrapolating with any kind of precision. You've heard about the 100,000 lives saved and the 5 million lives saved campaign and all those. When you look at the math behind those, they're take your mother's age and multiply it by your father's height and divide by the height of your dog or something. And these are random numbers. But what you do know is if the nice sugar study is true, implementation of tight glucose control caused or would have caused many hundreds of thousands of lives to be lost. Here is a list of all of the uh, um, randomized trials. Greasdale and colleague published these, medical, surgical, mixed and whatnot, and essentially it's flatly negative. What were the consequences of the original study? There were two consequences. The first was a profusion of randomized trials trying to replicate the Leuven results. Now, some people think the more randomized trials, the better. You know, if you have a good question and it's worth asking, then it's a good thing to do. However, the, the study was based on very dubious rationale. 
the studies were consistently negative, and the studies, I'm not sure if I'm going to explode or something, right? <laughs> no, somebody doesn't like me. But, uh, well, certainly it's not my phone. No, it's, I don't know. It doesn't matter, I'll shout above it. And there was a consistent signal of hypoglycemia. And we'll talk about whether this is a good thing or not in children. The next consequence was one of guidelines. And we'll talk about them a little later. I said that the first wrong target, I thought, was multiple, multiple tryings, trials trying to replicate it. And the second wrong target was the immediate adoption of guidelines enforcing the practice. They were paralleling the trials that were seeing whether the practice was good or not. Neither, in I think reasonable people's opinion, were actually valid. And the trials were mandated by the vast bulk of the agencies involved in guideline um, uh, mandates, such as the JCO, the IHI, Surviving Sepsis Campaign, American Thoracic Society, Veterans Administration Cooperative, and you name it, and all of the endocrine societies and indeed physicians and clinicians and hospitals were held to a standard of care based on the single study from Leuven. And this is despite study after study after study failing to replicate it. The next target, and all of that, was very nicely put in in the revised talk. But there you go. See, I saved a lot of bother. The third wrong target, I think, is nutrition. While the studies focused on glucose, that was the primary intervention, co-interventions, probably with nutrition, seem to be in fact a whole lot more important. Is that true? Look here, total non-protein calories. The Vandenberg study, way over 1,600 uh, per 24 hours. N of the nice sugar, it's practice across Australasia and Canada, far less than that, 1,200. What about enteral versus parenteral calories? On day four in the Vandenberg study, about 20% of calories were enteral, whereas about 80% of the calories that the patients were going to get were enteral in the nice sugar study. And what about the rate of introduction of nutrition? In the Vandenberg study, you see here that on day two, about 75% of the maximum rate had been achieved, whereas in the nice sugar study, on day two, about 60% of the maximum rate had been achieved. The wrong target, number four, the fourth wrong target, I think, is the control group. The control group is a really important issue. You can make a study look very good or very bad by having a very good or bad intervention or having a control group that simply is very different to the intervention. And so, independent of how good or bad the control or the intervention is, the study may well be internally valid. Well, that's a necessity for you to make progress. But the external validity is primarily anchored to the control group. If the control group care is kind of like your care, and the control group outcomes are kind of like your outcomes, and the intervention makes the patients a whole lot better, that's an intervention that you should take very seriously. If, on the other hand, the control group interventions <laughs> or the control group outcomes are nothing like your basic care, then probably the study is simply not relevant to your patient population. Because the cardiac surgical group was the prime mover of the first Leuven study, it's appropriate to look at the control group in that study and see how do they compare to the rest of the world. 